The last decade has been all kinds of wild, but it hasn't been The Walking Dead wild. Through all the zombies and bloodshed, AMC's hit show has survived for 10 years in the ravaged wasteland that is cable television. The Walking Dead has had some of the most lopsided and confusing time skips out there, so we've ripped it all apart and reassembled it into one digestible timeline. Just in time for the back half of season 10. This one is not going to cover most of the spin-off series Fear the Walking Dead, but leave a comment if that's something you want to see in the future. Pre-outbreak. Back in World War II, Rick Grimes' grandfather was a soldier. Every day he'd go to war already believing himself to be a dead man. When the war reached its end, he allowed himself to come back to life. Growing up, Rick would ask his grandfather questions about this time overseas, and these conversations would later inform Rick's survival in the apocalypse. Merle and Daryl Dixon don't have such role models. They lose their mother in a house fire, leaving them alone with their abusive father. He's so neglectful that he doesn't even notice when Daryl disappears into the woods for nine days. At last, Merle has had enough and moves out, leaving Daryl as the sole focus of their father's abuse. The two brothers rekindle their relationship later and lead a low life of delinquency and substance abuse. Over 150 years before the zombie apocalypse, the Green family bought a farm. It's been in the family for generations, and it's now run by Herschel Green. He's a bumbling alcoholic, but he quits drinking the day his daughter Maggie is born. His first wife, Josephine, passes away, so he remarries Annette, and they have a daughter together named Beth. Also, Annette has a son named Sean, but he, like so many Walking Dead characters, doesn't really matter. Last on the main character backstory roster, we have Michonne. She lives with her boyfriend Mike and their son Andre, and probably collects rainbow cat statues. 131 days before the global outbreak, the CDC catches the first case of the zombie virus. They co-name it Wildfire, and begin to study its reanimating effects on the human brain. Elsewhere, Rick has become a cop and lives in Georgia with his wife Lori and his son Carl. He and his son go on walks that Carl would remember for his whole life. In 2010, while out on patrol with his partner Shane, Rick gets shot and falls into a coma. Shane delivers the bad news to Lori, then continues to keep an eye on her and Carl in Rick's absence. As the zombie outbreak spreads, there are reports of inhuman aggression in five states. In due time, it reaches the rest of the country. Day zero to day 83. Days gone by. The infection goes global. Shane hurries back to the hospital to collect Rick's comatose body, but the military beats him to it. They're shooting survivors on sight, so Shane barricades the door to Rick's room and dips out of there. He picks up Lori and Carl and they hoof it towards a refugee camp, but the highway there is in total gridlock. As Shane and Lori get out to investigate, the military rains napalm down on Atlanta. The firebombing kills all the evacuated patients of Grady Memorial Hospital who are outside. With nowhere else to go, Shane and the crew set up shop in the quarry outside the city. They're joined by Carol Pelletier and her family. Shane and Lori figure that Rick is dead, so somewhere along the line, they start sleeping together. Meanwhile, in Baltimore, Lydia and her parents hole up in an emergency shelter. Weeks go by without anybody coming for them. Tensions escalate until Lydia's mom loses her mind, kills her husband, then takes off with their daughter. Around this time, Michonne, Andre, Mike, and his friend Terry take refuge at a survivor's camp too. It gets raided by walkers who kill everyone but Michonne. She blames Mike and Terry for Andre's death, so she slices off their arms and jaws with a katana and employs them as zombie shields. Then she loses her mind and takes off into the wilderness. Nearly two months after the outbreak began, Rick finally wakes up. He is just the most confused that anyone has ever been. Don't dead? Open inside? Now what does that mean? After stumbling out of the hospital, he meets Morgan and Dwayne Jones. They fill him in on the total hellscape that is the world. Oh, and there are zombies here now. The three load up on guns from the police station in part ways, with Rick heading to Atlanta to look for his family. He doesn't find them at first, but it does find a sick ass tank. Then he finds himself stuck inside it, trapped by walkers. Fortunately, another survivor, Glenn, guides him out by radio, and Rick joins up with Glenn's group. Hey, dumbass. Yeah, you in the tank. You cozy in there? They're part of the quarry group too, so they deliver Rick back to his family, and it's a happy ending all around. In like, you know, the micro sense. In the big picture, the camp gets overrun by walkers, killing some of the survivors, including Carol's abusive husband. Oh well. The surviving survivors head for the center of disease control to get some safety and some sanctuary. Well, they arrive, and Dr. Jenner has no safety and no sanctuary at all. In fact, he tells Rick that they're all infected and the world is forfeit, and then he blows the whole place to smithereens. With no idea what lies ahead, the survivors hit the road once again. As the group searches for supplies on a deserted highway, a swarm of walkers suddenly ambushes them. Sophia flees into the woods and vanishes, so the others go out looking for her. While Carl's searching, a farmhand named Otis accidentally shoots him. Rick and the others rush Carl back to Herschel's farm for medical care. The rest of the group relocates there as well as the hunt for Sophia continues. Little do they know, 
they don't have to look far. Otis already found her, turned into a walker, and stowed her away in the barn. On a separate supply run, Shane kills Otis, and then proceeds to lose his mind over it, while Glenn and Maggie Green hook up. Rick finds out that Lori has been sleeping with Shane and is now pregnant with his baby. After Rick and Shane butt heads over that, Sophia's containment in the barn, and their treatment of a hostage named Randall, Shane finally pulls a gun on Rick. Rick is forced to kill his old friend, then Carl puts down Shane's reanimated corpse. The gunshot attracts a horde of walkers, which demolishes the Green family farm and sends our group astray. Bad timing, too. Winter is coming. Day 84 to day 321. Rise the Governor. After being separated from the pack, Andrea meets Michonne, who's still prowling the wild. The two of them stick it out for the season, while the rest of the survivors move from place to place. Between their dwindling supplies and Lori's pregnancy, they decide to re-inhabit an old prison. While clearing out the premises, Herschel gets bitten by a walker. Rick amputates his leg. That's gonna put a damper on Spaghetti Tuesdays. They also meet this prisoner ensemble who don't really matter and all die within a few weeks. One of them does succeed in luring a swarm of walkers into the prison, resulting in the deaths of Lori and T-Dog. Maggie is able to perform a C-section on Lori, saving baby Judith, and before Lori zombifies, Carl shoots her. After learning of Lori's demise, Rick loses his mind for a while as he does some stuff and also some things. Simultaneously, Andrea and Michonne come upon a full town of survivors called Woodbury, run by a man known as the Governor. Merle has been there all this time, now sporting a bladed prosthetic arm and working as the Governor's henchman. Michonne finds all that to be pretty suspicious, but Andrea isn't too worried. After all, the Governor isn't overtly evil. I mean, maybe if he had an eye patch or something, it would drive the point home, but hey, he seems okay. It's not like he keeps his zombified daughter in a dungeon or anything. Unconvinced, Michonne skips town. Merle and some other red shirts hunt her down, but instead come upon Glenn and Maggie. Michonne sees them get captured and reports back to Rick at the prison. On the rescue mission, Michonne diverges from the squad and finds the governor's zombified daughter in the dungeon. And then the governor finds her. They fight, the governor loses an eye, and yes, also loses his mind. Okay, now I'm convinced that he's evil. After the invasion of Woodbury, the governor campaigns to destroy Rick's group. Andrea doesn't want to see her old crew get killed, so she acts as a mediator and arranges a meeting so the two sides can talk out their differences. The governor gives Rick a chance to surrender Michonne and prevent the war, but he has no plans to honor that deal. When Andrea learns about the governor's true intentions, she tries to warn Rick's group, but the governor imprisons her. He leads an army to the prison, but Rick's group ambushes them, scaring away most of the survivors. With his numbers dwindling, the governor flees, but by the time the group gets to Andrea, she's already been bitten. Michonne stays with her as she dies, and in her honor, Rick absorbs the people of Woodbury into their community, including Tyrese and Sasha Williams. Day 321 to day 554 life among them. After his failure at the prison, the governor's followers abandon him. He wanders aimlessly for two episodes of filler before meeting Tara Chambler and her family. Using his sparking personality, he's able to convince them to, once again, attack the prison. Morgan Jones is also alone, having lost his mind after the death of Dwayne. He meets a man named Eastman and his goat Tabitha, who teach him the art of Aikido. Yes, yes, this happened. A couple months pass back at the prison, and Rick considers giving it all up and living a simple life as a farmer. His group and the people of Woodbury enjoy a period of harmony until approximately the 500th day of the apocalypse in 2011-2012. They introduce a questionnaire that they use to recruit new survivors. How many walkers have you killed? How many people have you killed? And why? The governor returns for a second round of invasion, this time taking Michonne and Herschel hostage. Rick attempts to negotiate their return, but the governor decides that he's too far gone and decapitates the farmer. Now Christmas is ruined forever. The ensuing battle demolishes the prison and tears the group asunder. Rick and Michonne stay back to finish off the governor, then unite with Carl and his bucket of pudding. Over the next week, everyone has their own solo quests. Carol goes all of mice and men on a psychotic little girl, Daryl and Beth get blasted on moonshine and commit arson, Rick rips the guy's throat out, and Maggie, Sasha, Bob, Glenn, and Tara meet Abraham, Rosita, and Eugene. Those three are on a mission to save the world. Spoilers, it doesn't work out. Also, Beth gets kidnapped by cops and wakes up in a hospital with Everybody Hates Chris. All roads lead them to Terminus, a commune of cannibals that hold them hostage in a boxcar. The termites are all dead and gone in just a few episodes, though, since... Take it away, Rick. They're fucking with the wrong people. Morgan is still kicking it with Eastman and Tabitha. Both are killed by walkers, though, sending Morgan off on a journey to find his new kin. After dispatching the cannibals and meeting Father Gabriel, the group resumes their search for Beth. The trail leads them to Grady Memorial Hospital, but their hostage trade goes awry, and Beth ends up dead. Tyrese follows her lead, sinking the group to their lowest point yet, just when it seems that, yes, in fact, we are the walking dead. Rick and his friends are saved by Aaron. He delivers them to the Alexandria Safe Zone, a fortified town that has been able to survive this year and a half of Apocalypse. Spoilers, it doesn't work out. Day 584 to 628. 
all-out war. About a month goes by as the survivors get settled in Alexandria. Carl heals up just fine from his stray gunshot wound and starts rocking a sick eye bandage, while Rick and Michonne shack up in the best relationship since Glenn and Maggie. Sorry, Abrasita and Bethel fans. While out on a supply run, Daryl and Rick meet Jesus, a member of the neighboring Hilltop Colony. He warns them about a rival faction called the Saviors. They've got this whole grasshoppers from a bug's life deal going on with the Hilltop, where they oppress them and take half their supplies in exchange for not squashing them. So Jesus enlists Flick, I mean Rick, and his gang of circus bugs to help fight back. Rick and his team are used to this kind of thing, so they raid a Savior outpost. During the assault, Carol burns a whole bunch of people alive and loses her mind over it. She wanders off on her own, unwilling to be a part of the cycle of violence any longer. She's picked a good time, too, because the saviors find out about the outpost, and they are pissed. Which, come on, is a little justified, given that Rick slaughtered their people in cold blood. They blockade Rick and the entire A-team so they can't get to the hilltop colony, hurting them into a clearing. The king of the saviors, Negan, has been waiting for them there, and he's got his head bludgeoning pants on. To make a statement, he readies his bat Lucille, counts eeny meeny miny mo, and kills... I've been your host, Marcus, and be sure to subscribe to- Nah, just kidding. He kills Glenn and Abraham, and it's like, super gross. The group is traumatized, and agree to join Negan's Grasshopper program. After like, a whole entire week of that, Michonne declares that they can't live under the thumb of the saviors any longer, so she convinces Rick to start a rebellion. Meanwhile, Carol and Morgan discover a community called the Kingdom, ruled by the quixotic King Ezekiel, while Tara stumbles upon Oceanside. Also, Heath disappears to do a 24 spinoff and never returns. He probably died along with that show. Rick tries to appeal to the other colonies to help in the war, but no one bites. Even the scavengers, these weird trash-dwelling hipsters with their own language, are already in cahoots with Negan. Side note, if you invent your own language after just two years of the apocalypse, you probably had issues before the zombies showed up. Anyway, Spencer tries to collude with Negan, since Rick's reign over Alexandria hasn't been very good for his family. Negan sees through and kills him, prompting Rosita to shoot at Negan. She only hits Lucille, but inadvertently reveals that Eugene is able to make bullets. The saviors snag him for their own nefarious means. Rosita is still unhappy with how alive Negan is, though, so she teams up with Sasha and they sneak into the sanctuary. Sasha gets captured and imprisoned, but she convinces Eugene to help her out. He slips her a cyanide pill, turning her into a zombie bomb that blows up on Negan. The attempt is unsuccessful, but it gives the Alexandrias the opportunity to strike. Negan shuts that operation down pretty quickly, though. He's on the verge of killing Carl when the Kingdom and Hilltop make their dramatic entrances. Maybe Shiva could have picked a better person to mall to death, but... You know, still cool. After that long, no good, very bad week, the survivors call for an all-out war. The plan is to take out more savior outposts and then eventually attack the sanctuary head on. Maggie takes over as the leader of the hillside colony and begins conferring with Georgie. She's from a sophisticated community with technological advancements far beyond our militia's means. Elsewhere, the kingdom suffers some great losses. But no death hits harder than Carl's. He doesn't even die in war. He gets bitten while rescuing Sadiq from walkers. The poor kid is only like, 13. Apparently. But Carl's legacy is that there's more to life than going to war again and again and again. That resonates with Rick as the militia and the saviors enter their final battle. Eugene finally makes himself useful and sabotages the saviors' bullets, crippling them. Then, Oceanside arrives to clear them out. Elsewhere, Rick and Negan fight mano y mano. Negan has him on the ropes. Rick tricks him and slits his throat. Remembering Carl's last wishes, Rick spares Negan. All in all, the all-out war lasts about uh, seven days. Really, this whole Negan debacle happened over the course of a month, and they drew it out for two seasons. Yeah. Two whole seasons. Day 628 to day 1448. The bridge. About a year after the war, Lydia and her mother meet Beta in an abandoned hospital. They have a walker slaughtering meat cute, inspiring them to start the Whisperers. These stinky nomads wear flesh masks and live amongst the zombies in nature. Morgan takes this time to bug off into the wilderness, then ends up in Fear the Walking Dead and ruins it. Elsewhere, the remaining saviors have joined the militia under Daryl's watch, but it isn't all peaches and cream between them. Negan is still alive, just hanging out in a cell. Folks like Maggie and Daryl are unhappy with Rick's choice to spare him, while the saviors view it as a sign that the war is not over. Rick is oblivious to all that, though. He's just determined to live up to Carl's dream. He leads the construction of a bridge that will quicken the travel between the communities. No one really wants to make it, but they go along with the plan because, I don't know, do you want to say no to Rick? Remember that one time he ripped out that guy's throat with his teeth? But Maggie has a kid of her own now. 
little Herschel Ree, and she decides that enough is enough. She and Daryl distract Rick so that she can break into Negan's cell and give him the old Glenn treatment. But once she sees the sad, sorry state that Negan is in, she also chooses to spare him. Meanwhile, Rick stumbles upon a herd of walkers heading straight for the community. And oh god, they can use the bridge as a direct route there. What a horrible and unforeseen consequence of connectivity. To save his family, Rick blows the bridge while he's still on it. From their point of view, it looks like he blew up with it, but really he just flies off and floats a little bit downstream. Rick washes up on a nearby shore, conveniently in the same spot that the Trash Queen is calling for an airlift. The helicopter drops down and flies them both away to the wonderful land of spin-off movie trilogies. For months, Daryl and Michonne scrounge the riverbank for hide or hair of Rick. Alas, they only find his gun. During this vulnerable time, Michonne receives a visit from her old friend, Jocelyn. She welcomes her into Alexandria, but finds that Jocelyn has been raising a savage child army. That's weird, she didn't used to do that. To protect Judith from a Lord of the Flies nightmare, Michonne slaughters the kids and gets so duly traumatized that she locks down Alexandria's walls completely. Day 1448, day 3607. The Whisperer War. The communities exist like this for six years. Over that time, the kingdom begins to crumble. Daryl heads off into the wilderness with a dog, Maggie goes on sabbatical with Georgie, and Michonne gives birth to Rick's bastard child. So, good times all around. By the way, six years is nearly twice the amount of time that's passed in the rest of the show so far. To help fix up the kingdom's decaying infrastructure and rekindle the alliance between the communities, Ezekiel begins to plan a fair. The only question is whether or not Michonne will let Alexandria participate. Well, Judith is all grown up now, and the little ass kicker decides it's time to open Alexandria's doors again. She invites newbies Connie, Kelly, Magna, Yumiko, and Luke to stay in town, much to Michonne's chagrin. While she relocates them to the hilltop colony, recently re-civilized Daryl and his posse cross paths with the Whisperers. They kill Jesus, but the team takes a captive, Alpha's daughter Lydia. In their custody, Lydia bonds with Henry and decides to, you know, give regular life a chance. Alpha isn't pleased with that decision. She infiltrates the Kingdom's Fair and kidnaps Sadiq, Tara, Enid, Henry, and seven random other people, and decapitates them before Sadiq's very eyes. He loses his mind so hard that he represses the fact that he was held down by one of her lackeys. A brand new face in the Whisperer clan. Alpha mounts the heads on pikes. Then she shows Daryl the massive nuclear bomb of a walker horde that the Whisperers have been building. Months go by. And eventually, Alexandria welcomes a new survivor named Dante, who's totally normal and not even suspicious at all. He joins Sadiq in the infirmary. Not long after that, the kingdom collapses, and Carol and Ezekiel's romance breaks down with it. Several more months pass, bringing us to approximately day 3600, or year 10. The remaining communities have banded together in a coalition to stop any future Negans or governors or alphas. Rosita gives birth to hers and Sadiq's baby, a little girl named Coco. Ah, at long last, we have a child with two living parents on the show. After a long day of training, Judith discovers a whisperer mask washed up on the beach. It sends everyone into a frenzy, but no one quite as much as Carol. She's out for revenge after Henry's death, so she loses her mind, starts popping pills, and hallucinates her dead kids. The Whisperers employ other psychological warfare tactics, like a recurring onslaught of walkers and Somebody's poisoned the water hole! Totally normal guy Dante sabotages the filtration system, causing a chunk of Alexandrians to get sick. When Sadiq finally figures out what's going on, Dante kills him. Oh, shoot. Sorry, Coco. I spoke too soon. Aaron has been having secret meetings with a whisperer named Mary, and she reveals the location of Alpha's horde. So while Michonne sets sail for a naval base to retrieve supplies for the war, Daryl and Carol lead a team of warriors towards the horde. When they arrive at the spot, it's completely barren, except for Alpha. Carol chases her into a dark shaft, and the rest of the group follow her down. Now, trapped at the bottom of a cave, the survivors face a massive herd of walkers with their backs against the wall. And that's where The Walking Dead leaves off. What are your predictions for the rest of season 10? Let us know in the comments. I've been your host, Marcus, and be sure to subscribe to Cinematica for more timelines just like this one. Thanks for watching.